Hello, boys and girls. It's Mrs. Dissador here. It is Thursday, April 16th, I believe. And I am here for the fourth and sixth grade read aloud of Shelly. Okay, we left off yesterday with Mom is still in the hospital with the baby. Um, Michael isn't really going to school. He's been really upset. So that's given them time to kind of hang out with Nina more and get to know her since she doesn't go to school. She's actually homeschooled. Um, so we also learned when he was in the hospital, Michael visited his baby sister in the hospital and his mom. We learned uh, he went and was asking around about arthritis. And he's a little um, interested in it because he knows that's what that man who's living in his garage has. He has arthritis and he wants to know how to help him. So we said, they said to give him a cod liver pill, which is like fish oil pills that you can take. They're like a, a vitamin almost. So he was just um, asking around to see how he could help him. Uh, Nina still has not met him. I believe Michael wants to show him, show her he's living in the garage. So let's see what happens to chapter 19. Her blanket and books were still on the lawn, but she wasn't there. I looked up into the tree, and she wasn't there. I stepped over the wall, went to her front door, rang the bell. Her mother came. Is Nina in? I asked. She had jet black hair like Nina's. She wore an apron covered in daubs of paint and clay. She is, she said. She put her hand out. You must be Michael. I'm Mrs. McKee. I shook her hand. Nina, she shouted. How's the baby, she asked. Very well. Well, you think she'll be very well. Babies are stubborn things, strugglers and fighters. Tell your parents I'm thinking of them. I will. Nina came to the door. She had a pink, she had pink splash, a, a pink, uh, sorry, a pink splash apron on. We're modeling, she said. Come and see. She let us see the kitchen. There were big balls of clay and plastic bags on the table. The table was covered in a plastic sheet. There were knives and wooden tools. Nina's book of bird drawings was open at the blackbird. She showed me the clay she was working with. It was just a lump, but I could see the outline of a bird. A broad body, a pointed bill, a flattened tail. She added more clay and pinched the body and began to draw out its wings. Nina's fixated on birds just now, Mrs. McKee said. Sometimes it's things that swim. Sometimes it's things that slip, swing through the night. Sometimes it's things that creep and crawl, but now it's things that fly. I looked around. There was a shelf full of clay models. Foxes, fish, lizards, hedgehogs, little mice. Then an owl with its great round head, its pointed feet, its fierce claws. Did you make those? I asked. Mina laughed. <laughs> They're brilliant, I said. She showed me how the clay would be shaped if the bird was in flight how she could mark the feathers in with a pointed knife. Once it's fired and glazed, I'll hang it from my ceiling. I picked up a piece of clay, rubbed it between my fingers, rolled it between my palms. It was cold and grainy. Nina licked her finger, rubbed the clay, showed how it could be made shiny smooth. I watched her, copied her. I worked the clay again, drew it into the shape of a snake, pushed it all together again and made the shape of a human head. I thought of the baby. I started to shape her, her thin, delicate form, her arms and legs, her head. Like magic, said Nina. Like magic, yeah. Sometimes I dream I make them so real, they walk away or fly out of my hand. You use clay at school? We do sometimes. We did in one class I was in. Michael could come and work with us sometimes, said Nina. Miss McKee looked at me. Her eyes were as piercing as Nina's, but more gentle. He could, she said. I've told him what we think of schools, said Nina. Miss McKee laughed. And I told him about William Blake. I went on making the baby. I tried to form the features of her face. The clay started to dry out in the heat of my fingers. It started to crumble. I caught Nina's eye. I tried to tell her with my eyes that we had to go. Can I go for a walk with Michael? She asked immediately. Yes, wrap your clay in plastic and you can get on with it when you come back. All right, so that's the end of this chapter. I think I'll read chapter 20 as well. 
I led her quickly along the front street. Then I turned into the back lane. I led her past the high back garden wall. Where are we going, she said. Not far. I looked at her yellow top and blue jeans. This place is filthy, I said, and it's dangerous. She buttoned the blouse to her throat. She clenched her fist. Fist. Good, she said. Keep going, Michael. I opened her back garden gate. Here, she said. She stared at me. Yes, yes. I stood the garage door with her. She peered into the gloom. I picked up the rupee on the flashlight. We'll need these, I said. I took the capsules from my pocket. And these as well. So there they go, and they're going into the garage, and Nina's going to meet the man that's been living in the garage for the first time. Her eyes narrowed, and she looked right into me. Trust me, I said. I hesitated. It's not just that it's dangerous, I said. I'm worried that you won't see what I think I see. She took my hand and squeezed it. I'll see whatever's there, she whispered. What do you mean? I switched on the flashlight and stepped inside. Things scratched and scuttled across the floor. I felt Nina tremble. Her palms began to sweat. I held her hand tight. It's all right, I said. Just keep close to me. She squeezed between the rubbish and the broken furniture. Cobwebs snapped on our clothes and skin. Dead bugs attached themselves to us. The ceiling creaked and dust fell from the rotten timbers. As we approached the tea chest, I started to shake. Maybe Nina would see nothing. Maybe I'd been wrong all along. Maybe dreams and truth were just a useless model in my mind. I leaned forward, shined the light into the gap behind the tea chest. Again, she squeaked. I heard Nina stifle a cry. I felt her hand stiffen. I pulled her closer. I brought my friend, I said. Like I said I would. This is Nina. He turned his eyes toward her, then lowered them again. I showed him the rupier. I brought this as well. He laughed, but he didn't smile. I squeezed through to him. I snapped the top off the bottle with the opener on the knife and crouched beside him. He tipped his head back and let me pour some of the rupier into his mouth. He swallowed. Some of it trickled from his mouth onto his black suit. Nectar, he said. Drink of the gods. He tipped his head back again, and I poured again. I looked back at Nina's dark form looking down at us. Her pale face, her mouth and eyes gaping in astonishment. Who are you? She whispered. Mister had enough of you, he squeaked. <laughs> I saw a doctor, I said. Not Dr. Death. One that could fix you. No doctors, nobody, nothing. Let me be. You'll die. You'll crumble away and die. Crumble, crumble. He tips his head back. More root here. I poured in more. I brought these as well, I said. I held a cod liver ca oil capsule out to him. Some people swear by them, I said. He sniffed. Think of fish, he squeaked. Slimy, slithering, swimming things. There were tears in my eyes. He just sits here, I said. He doesn't care. It's like he's waiting to die. I don't know what to do. Do nothing, he squeaked. He closed his eyes, lowered his head. Nina came in beside us. She crouched, stared at his face as dry and pale as plaster, at the dead bugs and cobwebs, at the spiders and beetles that scuttled around him. She took the flashlight from me. She shined it on his thin body in the dark seat, on the long legs stretched out on the floor, on the swollen hands that rested at his side. She picked up one of the dark furry balls from beside him. Who are you? She whispered. Nobody. She reached out and touched his feet. I'm in cold, she whispered. How long have you been here? Long enough. Are you dead? She groaned. Big question. Always the same. Tell her things, I said. She's clever. She'll know what to do. He laughed, but he didn't smile. Let me see her, he said. Nina turned the light to her face, and it was brilliant white with thick dark gaps where her mouth and eyes were. I'm called Nina, she said. I'm Nina. You're... 
You're Amina, she said. I'm sick to death. She touched his hand. She lifted his filthy cuff and touched his scrawny, twisted wrist. Calcification, she said. The process by which the bone hardens becomes inflexible. The process by which the body turns to stone. Not as stupid as you look, she speaks. It's linked to another process, she said, by which the mind, too, becomes inflexible. It stops thinking and imagining. It becomes part of the bone. It is no longer a mind. It's a lump of bone wrapped in a wall of stone. The process is ossification. <sighs> he sighed. More rupia, he said. I poured more rupia into his mouth. The roof trembled in the breeze. Dust fell on us. Me and I crouched close together, our knees almost resting on him. She twisted her face as she caught the scent of his breath. I took her hand and guided it to his shoulder blade. I pressed her fingertips against the bulge beneath his jacket. She leaned across him, felt his other shoulder blade. When she looked at me, her eyes in the flashlight beam were shining bright. Her face was almost touching his. Their pale skin gleamed in the light. What are you? She whispered. No answer. He sat there with his head lowered, his eyes closed. You can help you, she whispered. No answer. I felt the tears running from his eyes. There's somewhere we could take you, she said. It's safer there. Nobody would know. You could just sit there dying too if that's what you really want. Something brushed past us. I shined the light down, saw a whisper of her cat entering the space between the two tents. Whisper, said Nina. The cat moved to his side, pressed itself against, against his damaged hand. He sighed. Smooth and soft, he whispered. His knuckles moved against the cat's soft fur. Sweet thing, he whispered. Whisper purred. The timber creaked, dust fell on us again. Please let us take you somewhere else. I said, more rupee, he whispered. I held out a cod liver oil capsule. Take one of these as well, I said. He tipped his head back. I poured the root beer in. I dropped the capsule onto his pale tongue. He opened his eyes. He looked deep into Nina. He looked deep into him. You must let us help you, he said. He was silent for a long time. He was silent. Okay, so let's stop there. So Mina met the man living in the garage or the creature. She kept saying, who are you? Who are you? What are you? To me, it doesn't seem like he's a regular man. It almost seems as if he's some type of creature or something. I, I don't know, but we'll get more information. But they definitely want to take him out of that garage because every time the wind blows, it kind of shakes and things fall down. So it's almost like that garage is going to collapse soon. And they don't want him to die and get hurt. So they're trying so hard to help him. But it seems like he doesn't want help. He's depressed. He's, I don't know. So they want to take him somewhere else, somewhere safer. Do you have any ideas of where they might want to take him? If you do, put it in the comments below. Or just give me a thumbs up. Let me know if you like this book. Maybe you don't like it as much and that's okay. Recently, I started a book. Um, it was called Hokey Pokey by Jerry Spinelli. Love Jerry Spinelli. But I stopped reading it because I didn't like the book. I gave it, I read a lot of it, and I said, I still don't like this book. So I just stopped reading it. It's okay to do that. But um, if you are enjoying this read aloud, I will definitely see you back tomorrow. And have a wonderful afternoon, and I miss you all. Stay well.